So in module two, we talked about uh, a key concept from the uh, definition of social role valorization that we can use to guide our actions. And that was the, the idea of valued social roles. In this module, we're going to continue on looking at one specific part of the definition of social role valorization, and that is um, mitigating some of the uh, experiences people have that puts them at value risk. And so we're going to focus in this module on understanding devaluation. Going back again to the definition of social role valorization, we uh, talked about uh, you know, the enablement, establishment, enhancement, maintenance, and or defense of valued social roles. And now we're going to look at thinking about the importance of valued social roles, particularly for people who are at value risk. So what do we mean by value risk? We talk a lot about bias these days, which I'm glad that we do. We talk about implicit as well as explicit bias. And we know that bias, uh, when people are on the receiving end of it, causes people to be vulnerable to being cast into a devalued societal status. And that may be a word that you haven't uh, thought of or used much, so I'd like to, to define for you, at least for the scope of this presentation and the ideas we're sharing with you, what do we mean by devaluation? So devaluation is the attribution of low or even no value to a person or group of people by another person or group of people on the basis of some kind of characteristic that uh, a person or a group has that is a difference that is perceived in a negative way. And so, for example, when you live with different kinds of disabilities within our culture, that's a difference from other people, which is viewed in a negative way. For example, I'll just speak of my daughter. My daughter uh, lives with Down syndrome. Now that's a difference from a lot of people uh, in our society. And it's a difference that in the eyes of many people is seen in a negative, um, a negative way. I'm not saying you would view Down syndrome uh, in that way, but many people do. And hence, that then causes the person who, who lives with uh, Down syndrome or has Down syndrome to be seen, perceived, and treated in a more negative way or devalued, being seen as less than, not as worthwhile as, and so forth. Again, going to the educational experience of my daughter, some years when she was in high school and also in middle school, uh, the teachers would say to me, well, you know, your daughter's really not going to be able to learn that much, so we'll, we'll just give her some things, you know, to, to keep her busy. As if her education wasn't as equally important as the education of the other students within, uh, within the class. It's a hard thing for us to think about, but actually in our society, there are numbers of groups of people who... Um, might experience devaluation and be thrust into a devalued status. So people of color have been talking about this and bringing this issue to the fore uh, recently in a very powerful way. Uh, people who immigrate here from other countries, people who are homeless, people who are struggling with addiction, uh, people who have impairments within their bodies and minds. Um, and these would just be some examples of people who are devalued in our society. Now, once you're devalued, okay, and we're going to talk a little bit about the process of devaluation, and we're also going to talk about what are your experiences likely to be if you are devalued. So the universal consequences of devaluation, well, first of all, as I've said, society devalues certain qualities and conditions. And then there are a number of consequences of that devaluation. The first one being 
that people who are perceived as being identified with a quality or characteristic that is devalued then become, as I've said, devalued, and their identity, and this is important, gets reduced to that of the impairment. So much so that sometimes people are literally referred to by their condition. So, uh, you know, I, again, in our daughter's life, there have been situations where literally our daughter was referred to as a Downs. Um, and, of course, you know, we have to remind people this is uh, our daughter, Mary, not a Downs. And then along with, you know, thinking about or reducing Mary's identity to that of, quote, being a Down, there are all kinds of assumptions about what Mary can and can't do and where she can and cannot go and where she belongs and where she doesn't belong and so on and so forth. And so throughout her education, she had the experience of people embracing her as she was fully included. But at the same time, there were people who really believed the best place for Mary would be to have been put apart and away in special education classes. And when we would try to talk to them, and Mary would try to talk to them about how uh, she loved being in regular classes with the support she needed in order to learn and how that was much better for her, they oftentimes had a very hard time hearing it because they had these preconceived and very set ideas about uh, and assumptions about what Mary could and couldn't do, etc. Now, I'm, I, these, of course, can have devastating... Some of these assumptions about people can have devastating impacts in people's lives, um, if people end up, you know, being put apart and away, for example, based on assumptions like that, or excluded from participating in all kinds of typical life experiences. And I want to say to um, to you that it is a very high likelihood that the students that are attending inclusive post-secondary education would have had previously before coming to university or college, all kinds of experiences like that. And it's important to be aware of these kinds of experiences because they can happen anywhere, anytime, even with the best of intentions. You know, once you're aware of it, you can be thinking about looking at the programs that you work in and making sure that people are, um, you know, valued uh, and in those valued roles and having all kinds of opportunities that are what is offered to, you know, the same kinds of opportunities that are offered to the other students. I think of a subtle example of, uh, you know, some of the assumptions that people might hold, even unconsciously, when a professor, this is another student that I was aware of who was attending university, and and the, this is a political science class, and the student, um, the students were given an assignment, and the professor just assumed that the student who was in the class with intellectual disabilities would be unable to do the assignment and went up to the student and said, you, you're excused from this assignment. You don't have to do it. Now, that was an assumption. And of course, the student could do the assignment with adaptations and modifications or maybe some other kinds of support. Um, and the professor wasn't, you know, trying to be negative um, the professor was actually trying to be helpful, but that just shows you the unconscious assumptions that oftentimes are displayed that come from perceiving people as, uh, you know, their identity is reduced to that of their impairment, which then, um, you know, is a very limiting view of people. Another very hurtful life experience for people who are devalued is that they continually get subjected to not only stereotypes, but really negative, um, negatively valued, devalued roles, in contrast to the roles that you've seen pictures of the students in. For example, I want to share with you some devalued roles that uh, people who have been thrust into devalued status have experienced in our society throughout history. The first one would be being seen as different, strange, odd, or maybe even de dangerous. So for example, I was on another university camp campus one time and there was a, a young man with autism 
on campus uh, and attending classes. And he had some unusual ways of um, expressing himself. And sometimes he would make loud noises uh, that would be a little bit startling, but, you know, he, it was just part of his identity. Um, and sometimes, you know, he would be talking to himself as he was walking through campus. And, and those are, you know, harmless kinds of things to do, but it was, it was just enough of a difference that he started to be perceived by other students, by uh, other people at the university, administrators and faculty and so forth, as being not only different, but odd and strange. And of course, once he got seen that way, then the people kept their distance, right? Didn't, and so he was on campus, but he really wasn't part of campus, simply because of a few harmless kinds of ways um, of uh, maybe expressing himself, I don't know, um, that were different. Another role that is a historical role is that of being a lifelong child. So this is particularly apt to be imposed on people who live with intellectual impairments, who are seen as um, you know, never really being able to grow up and always having to have um, you know, parental-like uh, guidance. And I can tell you that um, I've spent quite a bit of time with families whose um, family members have gone to university and college. And of course, it's hard for any parent when your family member goes off, uh, leaves home. It is particularly hard for family members um, of students with intellectual disabilities because um, of the usual reasons. And then on top of that, you, oftentimes families have been socialized to really um, embrace this role that their child, even though now an adult, really is never going to grow up. And so you can imagine, I think it, actually people can relate to this, how frustrating it is when you're an adult and you keep being treated as a, as a child. Another uh, role that people get cast into is that of being an object of pity and charity. And so how many times have you seen this in our culture where different groups of people who are devalued um, are pitied um, and are objects of other people's charity? So I think about some of the fundraisers, you know, that I've seen for different groups of devalued, marginalized people. They're all based on the idea of pity, not on the idea of, um, you know, right and deserving to be treated as a full citizen. Another very powerful role that um, people have been cast into that has devastating consequences is of that of being a burden. And so I do remember, and I've heard many stories like this, that when our daughter went to first grade and we, she was in a regular school and she was in a regular first grade classroom, that the principal said to us, are you sure that this is what you want? Because I'm concerned that Mary's presence in the class will take the time away from the teacher that she should be spending on the other students in the class. So that was um, an example of where my daughter was viewed as a burden. Um, and of course, you know, there, there were people who could assist and that wasn't true anyway. Mary, you know, fully engages and participates. But um, behind that is the idea of burden. And honestly, in uh, inclusive post-secondary initiatives, we've also heard the same thing from some professors. Not, a, not all professors, but some professors who said, well, you know, I've never done this before. I'm wondering, is it going to be a burden to the other students to have this student in the class? Uh, it may be a burden on me as a professor and so forth. And I think, uh, again, I'm not being critical of people. We've grown up in a society where we've learned these kinds of stereotypes without even knowing we've learned them. But I want to look at things from the perspective of people who are on the receiving end of it. So whether or not my daughter heard that comment, it would be hurtful in terms of her education. Whether or not the student heard the professor say that, 
it would still be hurtful in terms of the limiting of the person's um, education. Another role that people are put into is that of being trivial. And so over and over again, I have seen this in the evaluations that I've done of education programs for children from kindergarten through grade 12 um, in special education. And of course, there's some wonderful special education supports that have you know, done a great job of helping students to learn and grow and develop in the context of their schools and regular classes. Um, but then I have also seen a number of practices where students are really not learning that much. They're working on the same thing that they had, you know, in, in high school that they've been working on since they were in elementary school. And it is as if their time is not valuable and important. It's just kind of trivial. Let's just kind of keep people busy. And worse, I've seen that same thing happen in programs for young people after school. And so we have found in inclusive post-secondary education that sometimes, because the expectations have been so low for people, they haven't had the opportunity to learn the, the skills, the competencies to move into university easily. And so they, they need assistance and support, right? to respond to the higher expectations that are being placed on them that they never had when they were in, in high school. And lastly uh, is that you know people will be um, in the role of a dependent lifelong client. This is a very powerful, uh, powerful role and role stereotype that despite the fact that many people now uh, with disabilities have very full lives, are contributing members of the society, are uh, you know, earning um, money, are supporting themselves. Um, still, this is a very prevalent kind of stereotype that is out there, and sometimes it's actually um, encouraged. And so when we encourage people to be in the role of client, what are they going to be? A client. We respond to what is expected of us. So if you look at this picture, um, you read the title, okay, uh, there, Lancaster Sunday News, a special place for kids, a place to relate. Well, first of all, if you look at that picture, you see the young man there, he is not a child. He is a young adult, and it's easy to tell that. And he is pictured holding on to the legs of another person. Now, how old are people are when they hold on to the legs of another person like that? You're usually young, like one, maybe two years old, right? Uh, I think of my son that, you know, in the beginning of his young adult life, my son would never be holding on to the legs of somebody in, uh, in that way. And so it powerfully, you know, pictures worth a thousand words, puts this young man into the stereotype of being a lifelong child. You also um, get the image that he's different. He's different from other people his age. And, and a bit odd, you know, it's a bit odd. And then some people might look at this picture and say, oh, that poor man, what a shame that he lives with. Uh, you know, or he has this kind of disability. Other people might look at that picture and say, oh, this young man, what a burden he must be, you know, to the people who are working at that camp. So you can see, uh, you know, that in this one picture, we can see the major role stereotypes reflected. And here's another picture I want to show you. Now, this is, a, this is a current, these are all current pictures. This is a current picture of a day program which exists to this day for young people who have finished high school, who came out of the special education program. So here are these two young, uh, very vital looking guys. And what are they doing? They're sitting at a table with a child's puzzle in front of them. And if you take a look at the background there, you see the, the shelf. I don't know if you can see any of the things on the shelves. They are all toys designed for young children. So clearly, uh, you know, 
you can see these young men as well being cast into the role, being odd, different. Um, you, you think about a young person who was not in that day program, maybe one of the people who's you know going to university at, at Millersville, walking into this program and seeing those two young men. Um, they might be the same age as those young men, but what are they going to think about them? Well, this is kind of strange. I would never be sitting here you know, with all these childish games and toys and, and so forth. So they're put into that role of being odd, being different, being a lifelong uh, uh, child, being a dependent client, okay, being a burden um, of charity and, and the society and so on and so forth. And so to conclude when we're thinking about these role stereotypes, this experience, this, the experience of role stereotypes and its impact on people, they make people um, vulnerable to dependency, poverty, poor self-image, lack of belonging, loss of autonomy. So these negative stereotypes have really impactful experiences on people. And when people come to campus, I think that it is safe to assume that they will have experienced in some way, shape, or form some of these role stereotypes, which puts them at value risk. Another uh, powerful experience of devaluation that people have is being put apart and away from others in society. In other words, being distanced from others. And so there are several ways that people get distanced. One is by literally being excluded. If you spend any time with someone who uses a wheelchair, you know that despite all of the efforts to make uh, settings in our society accessible, there are still loads of places that you can't go to. Well, you could go to, but you couldn't get in them. Or once you get in them, you would not be able to use the restrooms because they are not accessible. So that would be an example. Uh, you know, of putting physical distance between ourselves and the people who make us feel uncomfortable or people we see as being unworthy, so to speak. Secondly, is we put physical distance between ourselves and others by physical segregation and congregation. So what do I mean by that? Is that we will put people together in a group who we think belong together because they're all kind of the same, and then we put them apart and away. And so still in our schools, this happens. Uh, I went to visit our local high school one time, and I was just appalled to see that First of all, there was a separate special, special education class. Now, not only was there a special education class, the students in the special education class arrived at the school on a different bus. They did not take the bus that all of the other students took. They arrived at a different time after all of the other students had gotten settled into their classes. Uh, they went to their classroom, and they never came out of their classroom. You think of a typical high school, kids are all over the place, right, throughout this school. The kids in the special ed room, they stayed in their classroom all day long. The only, thing, the only place they got to go was across the hall to their locker. They left school earlier than all of the other students. Um, so they didn't even encounter students walking through the hallways. Uh, and they went home on the separate bus. Now, that is a current example of this idea of putting people together and apart and away from everybody else. And so this puts you at risk. You think about what kind of message is being conveyed to those students in that high school about themselves, about their place in society, about their potential, about what they have to offer um, you know, to other people. Uh, and so... When we think about um, you know, inclusive post-secondary education, it's just a great opportunity to give people who may have had that kind of an experience an opportunity to be fully welcomed and to belong um, you know, on, in, a, in a typical way, typical campus and so forth. Okay, so here are some photographs of uh, you know, what I've been talking about, the segregation and congregation. 
You can see here the, the class of kids who are grouped together simply because they all use wheelchairs. Uh, and then you can see the large residence where adults with disabilities are living together, not because they chose to live together, they knew each other, and they, they said, let's get a big place to live and live together, but because they were put there by the system. And they also, this residence is a part and a way out in the country, so they don't even get an opportunity to see uh, neighbors and so forth. And this is a very interesting example where there was some consciousness that it would be important to have um, an adapted swing so a child with a disability or children with disabilities could, could swing on the swing in the, in the playground. But it's so interesting how this was done. If you notice, there's the adaptive swing. If you, if you just look in the distance there, you see the playground is right there, okay? But the swing has a fence around it. Not only does it have a fence around it, but it has the sign on the fence saying this is a restricted area. Only the carers are able to come into this area with a child who wants to go on this swing. Such a shame, right? So close, yet so far. In contrast to the next picture where this is a, a playground, an all abilities playground, uh, where kids of all abilities can play on this playground and have a good time together. And I just want to say, even in uh, you know some universities and colleges throughout our country, there are uh, classes, you know, special classes where people have been put together, congregated together, not based on interest or anything, but just because of their their label, uh, apart from the other students. Okay, so. Uh, classes for students with autism, classes, special classes for students with intellectual disabilities, um, and so forth. And what does that do? It just perpetuates the perception that people need to be a part, that they can't be included. And of course, you remember in civil rights, and uh, it was very clearly decided, separate was not equal. So what message is being given to people when we put them apart in a way about their citizenship? As well as physical distance, uh, we also can find examples of social distancing where people are present, but they're not part of. They're not really, uh, you know, uh, fully included. Here would be an example in a, um, a setting for younger children in school where the student is in the class it's hard to believe this still happens, right? But standing in the standing in the corner there in time out. Um, so in our college and university programs, sometimes you know you will see this where the students are physically present, but socially, the you know nobody's really engaging with the students, um, and uh, they're not really part of things, you know? They're physically present, but not really part and not really socially um, engaged. And so what does it say to another person? You know, when people don't want to be near you, around you, engage with you, you're not really part of things. You're always kind of on the periphery of being involved. Not only is a negative message, uh, you know, conveyed to people when they're distanced from others, but also it makes you less safe. You know, we, we know that the thing that makes us safe is to have other people around us. And so I think this is something that's been thought a lot about on college and university campuses, that, you know, you want to go places you, with your friends, be walking with another person, you know. So being with other people helps you as well to be safe and you're at risk if you're always alone. Um, another experience that people are likely to have when they're devalued that puts them at risk is they get stigmatized. Here's an example from the field of aging. We know that elders are on the receiving end of explicit, implicit bias um, as a group of people, and they're oftentimes thought in a negative way. So if you look at this slide, um, there you see, uh, you know, rest home. So is a nursing home, and where is it located? It's located on a dead end. So then to add insult to injury, of course, 
one of the stereotypes that surrounds older people, the way they get stigmatized, is, is that they're near death. So these images are pretty stigmatizing. Here's another one, the sign for the cemetery, right? The picture of the elderly people. And of course, the picture is not particularly flattering, the icon, right, with the older people bent over uh, and, you know, headed toward the cemetery, reinforcing that stereotype I just mentioned. And what kind of uh, image do you get of the people who are riding in this van when you see uh, you know, the the wording on the back of the van. And it's not only the name of the service there, but then you see it also draws your attention to, in case you observe any abnormalities, please call. So you just wonder, who's in that van? And all kinds of images are probably coming to mind. And this is a textbook that's used in university to teach students about uh, you know, helping adolescents who have emotional problems. Well, look at the cover of that book. What kind of image are you going to, to have in your mind of the people that you're supposedly learning how to assist? And of course, I just want to go back again to this picture. Uh, you know, the images there are so potent, so powerful. Just one look at this picture conveys so many negative messages about those vital young men based on the environment, right? The activities that they're engaging in, um, the, the toys on the, the shelf um, and so forth. So image matters when you are stigmatized, either as a group or as an individual, it puts you at value risk. Because when people think about you in a negative way, then they start to act on that thinking and treat you in a negative way. Whether that's done in a really obvious way or maybe in a more subtle way. So we want to pay attention to image um, when we're thinking about what are the images that surround the people uh, who are involved in the programs, the inclusive post-secondary programs. Now, people who are uh, devalued in our society also experience um, a lot of control. And this would be very true with people um, who live with a disability. There are all kinds of, as a common experience, as other people who tell you what to do, when to do it, how to do it, uh, and other people who want to make all of your decisions for you. And even some of the rules and regulations that we have in our society at large are very controlling over the lives of people who live with disabilities. And so I think this is an experience we can all relate to. It's really frustrating when there are people around you who want to control you. Um, and particularly as you develop into adulthood, and you want to make your own decisions. This is something that I think we need to be aware of, that there will be students who, uh, you know, are participating in the um, programs who, in fact, have experienced a lot of control. If you have experienced a lot of control in your life, um, what might be some of your reactions to that? One, might you, you might be very angry, and you might be doing your very best to try to exert control, and sometimes you might do that in a way that wasn't the most mindful way. Um, you may be you know, quite frustrated. Secondly, you may become passive. If everybody's told you what to do, when to do it, how to do it, um, and that's what you've gotten used to, you may be very frightened of making your own decisions because you, you don't have the experience, you don't have the knowledge base from which to do that. So we need to really think about this when we're supporting students in our initiatives uh, that this might be an experience that we want to really help students to make more decisions, to exercise that autonomy as I was talking about, um, about earlier with some safety nets if, if, you know, if people are going to make some unwise decisions. But when I think about university, college, going, you know, to technical school, a big part of that is learning how to make those decisions 
and being able to make mistakes within a safety net. Uh, and so um, that is an important thing to think about, you know, that people are at risk um, because they're devalued of having been controlled and not having had the opportunity to develop those competencies, and that can continue through your post-secondary education if we don't pay attention to it. Now, all of these experiences that we've talked about can be thought of as individual experiences. They could also thought be thought of as adding up, in summary, to this experience of having your life wasted. So, you know, if you're cast into those negative roles, if your identity is reduced to that of being an impairment, uh, if you um, are stigmatized um, and if you're controlled, et cetera, et cetera, um, that leads up to the wasting of a life. The wasting of a life is a horrible thing. And this is one of the reasons I'm so passionate about inclusive post-secondary education because it's the exact opposite of life wasting. It's life giving, life fulfilling, life realization if there is such a thing as that, realizing your life and your place in the world. All of these experiences then culminate with this last point we wanna make and that is that people have been subjected or people get subjected to discrimination and discrimination puts you at value risk. And we can assume that the students who are involved in institutions of higher learning will have experienced some um, discrimination. And we know that there is a lot of discrimination in our society of many different uh, groups of people and individuals within those groups. And I think that we can be certain that the students who come to us in inclusive post-secondary education will have experienced some discrimination. And to recognize that, be conscious of that, is, I think, an important, um, um, an important thing to do. And to realize that actually coming to university or college um, is a great way to deal with what you, the, the impacts of the discrimination. You'll have a chance to meet other people who've also dealt with discrimination and to join together with them and to figure out how to, how to overcome it, how to give voice to it, um, and how to uh, you know, rise above some of those experiences that you've had of discrimination and to move forward in your life. So thank you very much. And in the next module, we will move forward with the last part of the social role valorization definition uh, that's very helpful in terms of guiding our actions in inclusive post-secondary education.